last talk of the session is uh, titled Meta Optics in the Visible. It's by Professor Federico Capasso from Harvard University. Okay. Uh, I want to thank for the invitation to give this uh, uh, talk. Uh, and I want to concentrate on uh, the work on, yes, on, uh, on the work that my group has been doing in uh, the last few years, and I will explain what I mean by meta-optics. I'm going to concentrate in the actual visible rage. Before I move over, because it's, it is about meta-surfaces, there are, I want to sort of advertise two other sessions that are going to be occurring uh, later. One is this one here, and in particular, there are two talks here. There are Related to the broad topic of metasurfaces, there is one by Harry. I think he has actually changed the actual. He has changed the. Sorry about this. He has changed. I'm going to stand like this, kind of like a soldier, which is hard for me. No, no, you can put it a little. You can hold it. Later. Okay, you're super. <laughs> now I can move. And then the next one by Andre Faraon, and because there is a very interesting development. Uh, in uh, so-called flat optics towards conformal optics, basically substrates of any shape that you can think of. And uh, so uh, of, often one gets the question, what's the difference between the doing diffractive optics uh, with uh, metasurfaces as opposed to uh, Fresnel optics? Well, uh, the key point comes actually the uh, I started to collaborate with the Google, with the Google Glass group uh, headed, uh, he's now moved to Microsoft by Bernard Kress, and he said, you know, for us, from a technology point of view, is a using a metasurface, it's a sub-wavelength uh, 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 digital mask, okay, you can create an arbitrary face profile with a single mask level. This is all. It's a bit of a simplification, but it captures the technology essence. And you can see that with traditional Fresnel optics, it gets quite complicated to get these, these actual uh, profile like this. Uh, Multi-wavelength operation is, uh, is actually hard. There is a, fine, a finite lateral phase control here. There are still problems I've learned, which is a paradox. This is called diffractive optics, but I tell you it's difficult to get a truly diffraction limited spot with conventional diffractive optics. So there are still effects, particularly in uh, uh, displays at the edges like a hail, halos. Uh, there's uh, still, there are, can be problems of shadowing, rainbows, and so forth. Uh, the main point besides this here is that here, we, with a single mask, we can embed multiple function on uh, the same plane. So we can, we, we can play many interesting games. Some are just for actual fun, and we should have fun, but many are actually useful. So I'm going to give you some examples of what uh, useful thing we can do with uh, multifunctionality. So this gives a quick uh, thing where I think this uh, will have impact. There is a definitely... Uh, an impact in making thin camera modules using the same technology that we make ICs to make in the actual future lenses and so to squeeze everything down uh, for uh, uh, VR and, uh, aug uh, and augmented reality. Uh, it's a very interesting application for white lighting. We had a very fun collaboration with actually Osram. I told you about briefly conformal optics, but that's going to be covered by uh, Andre. And uh, in medical, it's very exciting what we're going to do. We have just started the work with uh, NGH, with a group at M and, M and MGH to build an actual stethoscope. I'm not going to talk uh, uh, about it here because I don't have time. We're using an actual meta lens. They have been able, made by my group, they have been able to image an actual uh, uh, tumor inside a, uh, a, a, a lung with a resolution which is unprecedented. So we are very excited about this type of medical application. And of course, I've worked for many years in the actual mid -IR, and uh, we can do much better, we think, in the future than uh, refractive optics. And uh, this is very simple. So we start with a single mask, and we create, we actually digitize the phase function that we actually need here using these, uh, these pillars. There is a large choice of pillars. Here I've shown the simplest one, which is a cylindrical pillar. And by changing the, uh, the, uh, the uh, diameter, we, shall, we can actually control the phase shift anywhere from zero to, uh, to pi and actually beyond. And this is important for uh, creating the actual wavefront. 
And you can think physically, that's how we start. You know, we like to think simply about things. And uh, just by Huygens' principle, you can design these wavelengths here by engineering these pillars the way you actually want and cre so create wavefronts that are of arbitrary shape. And uh, besides uh, uh, the issue of uh, simplicity, uh, uh, the ability, uh, uh, a smaller footprint and so forth, thickness, uh, there is a control of uh, aberrations that can be favor favorable, at least in certain circumstances, compared to other type of optics like refractive optics and the multifunctionality. Now, I'm not trying to, it would be re re require me 10 slides to show, but this is a smorgasbord on the kind of interesting stuff being done by various groups with actually meta surfaces. And you can look at it in several axes. You can look at it on the wavelength axis. There's been all uh, the way to, from the terahertz to the actual blue. Uh, we are trying the deep UV now. And, uh, but you can look in terms now of different materials like phase change material here from the Zeludev's group, uh, nonlinear optics here from the Alu-Belkin group uh, and so forth. You can look at the functionality, hologram lenses like here from the, uh, from the Brongesma uh, uh, group. Uh, we started with this area here by these V antennas to uh, do kind of interesting thing, the group of large Shalev uh, and so forth. I don't want to forget the early work on sub-wavelength grading by the uh, Fatal group, and it's very interesting because they're really the first one to show that with a single sub-wavelength grating, you can actually have extremely high reflectivity and you can phase things by having non-uniform uh, uh, non-uniform type of structure. You can phase things so that you actually focus uh, uh, you can get a focus beam out of the sub-wavelength grating. And these are two recent re reviews. This is from my group, and uh, there, is a, uh, earlier, uh, there is an earlier one here. So, so I want to So we asked the, uh, the question, you know, I started in the actual mid -IR and we did a lot of fun things with quantum cascade laser and so forth to collimate these beams in actually space, essentially making a metal lens over a, uh, the facet of actually quantum cascade uh, laser. We were motivated, in fact, by a great question by one of my atmospheric uh, <laughs> colleagues, uh, Professor Jim Anders, who asked me one day, Federico, can you collimate one of the quantum cascade lasers that I place in my uh, drones to look at high altitude clouds by backscattering and to eliminate completely the optics? So that's how it all started for us. We built a collimator on the facet of a QCL. We reduced the divergence by more than, than an order of magnitude. We moved to the near infrared, and then, of course, realized that plasmonics doesn't work. But to move to the visible, we had to do something different. So one of my brilliant students, uh, Rob Devlin, came up with this atomic layer deposition process to make high quality meta surfaces for the actual visible. Although we did this with e-beam lithography, this can be migrated quite directly to deep UV or extreme UV lithography and uh, possibly nano imprint, although then you run into problem with the height, so there's a lot of work to do with nano imprint here. But we start with e-beam resist thickness here, we actually pattern it, okay, then we conformally grow. This is a conformal process, an atomic layer deposition. It's layer by layer. And eventually you fill in everything. This is a maximum feature size, let, let, us, let us say. So you, thick, you, you fill it up to this thickness here. There is a chlorine etch. Then you remove the resist and you're left with a perfect complementary copy of what you actually started with. Now the key point, and we have detailed that in a long paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, in fact at the same time of our science paper, you need to grow to have high quality and low roughness in the amorphous state. So you want to minimize, completely a, a, eliminate any crystalline in uh, occlusion. So this is grown at 90 degrees centigrade. If you do that, you get a highly reproducible process. These are different metasurfaces that we made. This is a generic one. This is part of a lens. This is very interesting. This is a spin to orbital angular momentum uh, con, uh, con, uh, converter, which creates a vortex state. Okay, and we have shown we can make vortices up to very high orbital angular momentum, up to probably 15, actually 20, but I'm not going to talk about this today. And the key point you see, this is a pillar, uh, a fin that was knocked off. You get absolutely uh, very low roughness, if that's less than a nanometer 
roughness, you have good control. It's a highly reproducible process. These are fins that are high, typically hundreds of nanometer. You can make them with high aspect ratio and so forth. Now, these are the optical properties on our film. You can see you get a fairly high refractive index, which is good for confinement. An important point is K, the imaginary part, essentially of negligible loss across the whole visible, and you can see the roughness here. So this is, uh, we are very happy with this process, it has been reproduced, and uh, uh, so I want to give credit to earlier work. This is why the Philippe Lalanne group, uh, and uh, uh, many years uh, ago, tried out actually to make with titanium oxide using a different process, EBMA uh, uh, vaporation plus writing, and I want to stress reactive ion etching. So they definitely got some interesting preliminary work, but simply they were technology limited. This, uh, the fact that it's not vertical severely uh, introduces phase error. In fact, uh, just a four degree step we have, we have calculated can create essentially a phase error such that you can wipe out uh, the possibility of seeing a, a diffraction limit. So although it's a very interesting thing, I think this uh, is a message here that the technology, underlying technology by which you want to implement center certain ideas and so forth is absolutely crucial. And uh, now often I get the question, oh, but ALD is actually a slow, slow process, so I decide we do with my students the exercise. These are commercial systems, they do AL, uh, ALD. You can start with uh, a six millimeter square die size. You want to make lenses and then you want to get an extra, uh, uh, extra space behind for buffers, so called for actual dicing. You know the ALD process cycle how much it takes, it's 0.75 angstrom uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, titanium oxide and uh, each cycle takes uh, 17 seconds. So you can put the number and you see that these reactors could, can in the future crunch through up to 70,000 chips per hour to make your, uh, your uh, lenses. So this is not a limiting uh, factor. Now this was our step, uh, first step to make a high quality, in fact I've, I was on sabbatical at, uh, at Zeiss and they told me, well, Felix, you want to try it out, make a high numerical aperture uh, lenses, infinity corrected, and, um, and then uh, compare it to an uh, objective. So that's what we did. And so these we use berry face, so they are polarization sensitive. Now, of course, I want to remind everyone here, this goes back to Berry and uh, Pancharatman, but experimentally they were tried by various groups to do sub-wavelengths grading, uh, uh, if you like, metasurfaces and so forth. Uh, uh, and uh, these are the groups, for example, of uh, Eretz Hasman at Techion or Shia Feynman and actually many other that have uh, done kind of nifty things with these fins. We have used them to make these visible lenses, so we have gone up to three, li three li millimeter, completely limited by e-beam lithography, uh, these kind of focal lens. Uh, and uh, basically the uh, results, these are three lenses made at three different wavelengths. You get the fraction limit, you compare to a state-of-the-art ob, uh, ob, uh, objective. It's not fair to say that we are, we are doing better. The reason it looks better, it is better, is because they correct also for other aberrations, obviously. But it is an, an important milestone to have realized. And then we, of course, move to non-polarization uh, insensitive. So I want to remind you how, uh, first of all, a diffraction, a diffraction limited lens works. Uh, for uh, uh, infinity uh, co correct, it means normal incident and, uh, call, and coming from infinity, you have to implement this phase here. And it's very simple to understand physically, okay? The actual propagation phase from any point x, y is actually this here. So you have to compensate with the antennas here, with your pillars, the phase difference before, between the central ray and any peripheral, and, and any actual ray. So, and you have to uh, cancel out this phase difference. That, that should be a minus sign here. And uh, that works. And uh, so you create the key point, you create a library of uh, phase shifters. And then, of course, when you do the, simul uh, you, you do the simulation, you, you crunch things out. And so for this is an example. If you like, can see these are Fresnel zones. Of course, they are Fresnel zones. The way you see this physically, the phase shift goes from zero to, uh, uh, to actually two pi here. But it's and every time zero to two pi, but it's over a shorter distance. This is because you have to bend the rays more and more to be focused here. You can see the pillars; it's still high quality, 
And uh, we, did, we, have, we haven't done nothing so far to optimize the efficiency, but we can go higher. So we have done, for example, for uh, the red and green for this numerical aperture up to 60%. We have got even higher at some wavelengths here in the actual red for an NA, an NA, an NA of actually 0.6. Uh, and uh, uh, we get also here diffraction limited focusing, as, as you can actually uh, see. Uh, by looking at the difference, the, the ratio between the actual peak of the measured IRI, IRI disk and the, and the calculated one, you get the so-called strail ratio that tells you how close you are to the diffraction limit. In this case, we get strail ratios greater than actually 0.8. Now, of course, when you have a numerical aperture of, of, of uh, close to unity, you can do subwave imaging, as we've shown here, with a nanoscale series of uh, uh, holes made by FIB in an actual... Uh, uh, in an actual uh, film here, and then it is illuminated by green light, and we actually look at the image. I want to mention two things. You definitely can resolve sub-wavelengths feature here, but you start to see coma, you see. You start to see coma because these lenses are def uh, uh, designed for infinity correction and normal incidence, but the op with a finite object, light comes at a given angle, so you get these tails, the so-called coma. So you have to correct that. Uh, several groups have tried this. Uh, in fact, Andy Ferron group has done it for the, for the near AI using an actual doublet. I'm going to uh, two, uh, two, uh, two metasurface. I'm going to show you our result in the actual visible just published using the, uh, the in this case, the, uh, these, uh, um, these, uh, these fins here. So the, the key understanding physically is uh, the following. Okay, you have to be able to focus diffraction limited for different angles of incidence here. So first you can think, I will design this lens here. I cannot I, uh, design it as an hyperbolic phase lens because that has coma, okay? So I first design something that I call a modified focusing meta lens that corrects for actually coma, but does not correct for, uh, it's still, a still spherical ab aberration. Then I put in front, this I call a Schmidt plate. If you look in Hiking's telescopes, they compensate the uh, aberration, at least for some of them. The spherical one is by putting a phase profile like this so that the peripheral rays that in uh, refractive optics uh, tend to be converged more uh, through this uh, opposite sign of uh, the phase here, you put some divergences so you bring it back. So now combining these two, we now use the ray tracing Zemax because that's the tool that everyone uses, including industry. So this is how it shows. If I take the simple, the original lens designed for, uh, for infinity correction, I get coma. If I come at different angles, you see here, I get this type of uh, if this uh, aberration here. Now, uh, now I can design a modified singlet meta lens. So that for different angle of incidence, it sees, shows very similar focal, focal property, as you can see. But there is spherical aberration, as you can see. So now by adding the aperture in front, what I call the equivalent Schmidt plate, I can bring back everything to the focal point and I, have, I can have diffraction limit for a finite uh, uh, field of view. In this case, we have done it for a field of view of uh, total of 50 degrees plus or minus 25. So you can see basically a very close to diffraction limit uh, are actually uh, across the field of view. If you look at images, you can certainly see, you can't see those, uh, those actual tails that represent coma. Now the next step, which is a difficult one, is to, and this actually was work that was motivated in my collaboration with uh, uh, the uh, Google Glass team, they asked us to make collimators, but also lenses that would focus only three wavelengths at a certain focal distance. So the way you have to do this is the following. You see, again, you have to now making sure that for certain colors, the total phase shift, starting from here, from the particular pillar to here, is the same for all the wavelengths. And that's not easy because there is this lambda thing that so tells you it can't be done. So the way you must do it now is by engineer locally the phase and we use basically resonators, uh, coupled uh, fins that have certain resonance, a certain wavelength to undo the difference in phase shift at a different wavelength. And this is some of the, comes from our data and simulation. So we are not quite there, 
because you know, we would like to fall off the cliff here quite rapidly, and we, we haven't quite done it yet, but the good point, we have at least shown that we can focus three different wavelengths. This was a telecom at precisely the same uh, uh, distance. This was done in uh, amorphous silicon, was actually acting like a cylindrical lens to make things simple, and you see these resonators here, you can introduce resonances that you can use to achieve, uh, to achieve those equiphase situation for the three wavelengths. So we get basically close to the fraction limit at the three uh, different uh, telecom wavelengths. But then to the visible, and that's harder. There are many groups working on that. The holy grail would be to make a broadband lens across the whole visible where you correct for everything. Is there such a thing? Yes, but it's not widely used. It's called a super acromat. If you go to the website of Zeiss, you'll find there's this beautiful lens that is uh, diffraction limited uh, across the whole visible range and corrects for the other uh, aber aberration. It is, a, it is a fancy thing like this. So what I've learned actually, before you try to do any kind of new lens or lens, you, the application defines your aberration budget. This is what I was told by our Zeiss collaborators. Define your, aberration, your application that defines your aberration budget, so you stay within the actual budget. You, didn't, you don't need to optimize everything. For one thing, cost would be too much. So here we ask the question, can we make a, an achromatic meta lens over L, an LED bandwidth in the actual visible? So this is more difficult than the three wavelengths, right? Because you cannot use resonances. You would have to have an infinite number of, uh, of resonance. That approach doesn't work. So we use square pillars, polarization intensity. Notice here we use actually near field, we use coupling between the thing and that helps. And this is a picture of this, uh, again with the titanium oxide, you can see the quality. And so we use this phase shifter here and we, we work in uh, reflection to increase the phase shift. That is not required, but it made life easier for us. And what we do, there is not a one-liner that I can explain physically how it actually works, but I can give you two points, two approaches. One is that we use two degrees of freedom, okay? Several phase, basically we allow uh, uh, phase shifts that are larger than actually two pi, multiple two pi. And then a key point that several phase shifters can implement similar phase at one wavelength, okay? You can see here at one wavelength, but distinct phases at, uh, at other wavelengths. You can see also these uh, kind of uh, structures here with rapid variation. So you see we are engineering the, uh, the dispersion here, and we are using here this so-called guided uh, uh, mode resonance. It goes from the old work on, uh, of uh, Robert Wood in the early 90s, the Wood uh, uh, an an anomalies and so forth. But basically, if we see satisfy this condition that the unit cell is less than the wavelengths in, uh, in, uh, in, in air and the uh, wavelengths in the titanium oxide pillar, we can have coupling, we can have guided wave resonance, and this uh, expands the phase coverage. So the net results of our experiments are here. We have achieved constant, basically constant focal length across 60 nanometer bandwidth, which is already significant. Okay, simulation experiment go along pretty well. This is just a reference structure done with the actual uh, berry phase uh, lens and so forth. We, we can get very nicely close to uh, diffraction limit at the three different uh, wavelengths here at, at the two edges of the band and in the center. And uh, interestingly, we have also shown theoretically here, but then there was an experimental demonstration about the same time by the, by the Andrei Faraon uh, group uh, to make a diffractive lens. You see here, you can sort of change the way of thinking about diffractive optics. Usually you learn in text in diffractive optics, the focal lens, okay, as you, as you increase the wavelengths, the focal lens becomes shorter, ex exactly the opposite of refractive optics. But that's sort of a kind of bias. By designing these diffractive elements with using, the, if you like, these metasurfaces, you can actually do the opposite, as we have shown here. Okay, you can create an actually uh, diffractive lens with reserve, reverse chromatic dispersion. This is kind of fun, you know, one of my postdocs said, Federico, do you realize that if you want a, a high quality immersion of uh, objective, the end lens here, okay, has to be made by hand. I couldn't believe it, him 
But then I went on the website, and you can see the Nikon website. For the absolute state-of-the-art one, the last lens has to be molded, essentially, last step by hand. So this motivated us to see, can we make an immersion ob uh, objective using metasurfaces? OK, it should be simple. It's planar and so forth. So we tried it with water, with oil. And this paper, in fact, was just uh, uh, published here. You make a metasurface. And these are the parameters here. This is the actual liquid. You can use oil, uh, water, whatever. You want, of course, a refractive index uh, as high as you actually can to get, uh, uh, to, get to a high numerical aperture beyond, uh, beyond unity. So these are the kind of spots that we got for, uh, for a, an immersion of uh, objective, meta objective with oil in the green and in the, and in, uh, and in the actual blue. Again, we are at the diffraction limit. And we were able to uh, do na some nice nanoscale imaging of these, of these uh, grading targets here with, you see, features less than 200 nanometers, basically. So now this is very recent work, not published yet, but uh, there's been a lot of interest uh, of making lenses that are tunable. The holy grail is to make a, a, an actually uh, a, a lens that is electrically tunable, where not only you can control the main thing, the focal lens and the magnification, but also the aberration. That's exactly what electron optics does. But in fact, they are beyond. They are doing better than conventional optics. So we started a project in my group. This is, and uh, so again, this is the way you typically do uh, components. Uh, uh, is by doing translation, you, you can control uh, the uh, magnification, the focus. And so I'm not going to go into liquid crystals and special light modulators. And so our uh, approach is in collaboration with the material scientist, Professor David Clark is to combine the properties of dielectric elastomers, okay, like uh, silicon, where you can apply a field this way that you can uniformly stretch them, and there is practically a negligible variation of the actual thickness. So a process that I don't have time to describe here, my uh, group was able to transfer metal lenses, in fact, quite large ones, as you can see here, uh, directly on the, on the elastomer, and then what is the uh, electrode? Of course, if it is a thin film, it's not going to work. You're going to break it up. Doesn't matter what you use. At least I don't know of any thin films that stretch, does not break, break, break up. So we have used the high density single wall carbon nanotubes. As long as you don't need current, they work fine. Okay. So the key result here is, and in fact, uh, the, uh, the way it works is this. You can actually stretch the focal length here, change the focal length by very significant value here, uh, in this case from 50 millimeter to up to 120 millimeter, a staying diffraction limit. And uh, you might worry about these voltages, but let me remind you that the flashes in cell phones are quite high, high voltage thing. Anyway, we think we should be able to scale this down uh, below, below, below one, uh, one Kelvin. Not shown here is we have shown that we can control image shift by electrical mill and also compensate the astigmatism, which is uh, quite exciting. There is a lot of application for flat, planar, very focal lenses, optical zoom, which is called uh, par focal zoom for chip scale image sensor. I'm fascinated about making a light wave infrared night vision goggle. In this case, we can utilize, they're very heavy. So I have a colleague, actually, Kit Parker, who is a member of the actual uh, uh, special forces and a professor of physics at Harvard, that tells me, Federico, make for me something light so I can fly a helicopter in the actual dark, not for one hour, but maybe five, ten hours. And the idea here is to use, actually, for this voltage here, the, the high voltage of the multi-channel plate that these night vision goggles use. So the, I want to cover briefly now the multifunctionality of these. Again, the key point is this. With a single digital mask, you can create any face profile that you want. I'm going to show you this uh, here very quickly. So first thing, uh, um, chiral imaging. You, you can have a chiral object that, if it's illuminated by light, which is uh, right circularly polarized, will create, will have a certain reflectivity and a certain spectrum. And if you hit it with the opposite polarization, 
you have a different thing. There are certain beetles that behave like this. So here what uh, my people did, they designed a metal lens that if you hit it, it's based on berry phase. Essentially you mesh two uh, design. If it's hit with a right circular polarized, you, you create a focal here. If you hit with uh, the other, you create a point. Here this is a, uh, uh, shows a micrograph. So you can buy this stuff from actually Thor Labs, okay, for a few dollars. And uh, you can see as you illuminate with different light, you actually create two different foci here. And you can study as we did the actual spectral property. Now what's the big deal? The big deal is if you want to do chiral imaging by conventional, by conventional plates, that's what you have to do. You have to have several face plates here, two arms. And in this case, we are able to do it basically with uh, this, uh, this dual metal lens, single surface, and uh, a camera. This we are going to pursue because we actually want to lead to a really something that is commercially possible. You see, if you make a, you know, if you want to have high resolution in a, in a spectrometer, spectral resolution, there's nothing, you have to increase the actual path because you use dispersion. And you typically have a collimating uh, mirror and then you have a focusing mirror and again you have dispersion, so this has to be pretty long. For high resolution, you typically need something like one meter. So uh, my student, uh, Alex Zhu, had an idea here is to use an off-axis metal lens designed on purpose that you focus off axis and a tiny change in wavelengths creates a large angular dispersion here. So we published this here, this is just the beginning, there is a lot to do. The preliminary comparison look good. We are able to, of course we can't get yet the range of a conventional uh, uh, spectrometer but we are working on it with different type of lenses. We got up to 200 nanometer and the key we were able to achieve however a resolution of 0.05 nanometer comparable to this uh, object here with a very small propagation uh, uh, distance, you know, less than, a, uh, less than a centimeter. So we think this certainly is a fascinating uh, uh, direction for work. Now this is uh, quite exciting. Uh, André Ferrons and his group published this paper here where they showed that essentially you, you, you can encode in a, in a, in a, in a metasurface, let's say two arbitrary phase functions. One could be uh, a particular, uh, in one example, they were radially focusing light, and uh, another phase function does a completely, another phase that is a completely different thing. And then there is only the, uh, the constraints that you have to hit it with perpendicular polarization, and then as you hit it with one, you, you recover one of the embedded images, let's say a hologram, and with the other, uh, with the other polarization, you actually uh, uh, re recover the other one. I'm going to show you the work that we have been doing simply and essentially with the titanium oxide in the actual uh, visible. And so here we are retrieving two different images by using a a right and left circularly polarized light. We have a dog, we have a, we have a cat here. Of course, we still have a zero order problem. This we're going to get rid of in the future. And the way to do it is to combine you see, if you, if you just do the berry phase, it doesn't work. You can encode two images, but then in the actual far field, you will see simultaneously both images. Let's say with one polarization. If you change the polarization, the images will turn around this way. If you combine the berry phase with the propagation phase, with fins made this way, you can actually access the two images, the two hologram independently, just with the constraint that the two incident polarization to recover the two holograms separately have to be orthogonal. And uh, I want to basically, I'm close to the end here, fascinated by axicons. You know, these create Bessel beams. Uh, the physics is very simple here. And this is a zero order Bessel beam. And the problem with axicons, they have low numerical aperture. Of course, they have high efficiency. Well, because there is total internal re, uh, refraction. So, now the other trick is to use a, a high numerical aperture ob, uh, objective. And now you see if you have an aperture here, you only use these rays and they interfere constructive. This is your pencil of light, which is your J0 uh, uh, Bessel beam. It's not quite, uh, it's called Bessel Gauss beam. But now you can ask the question, what if I, what I want to 
overcome these limits and do something more complex. Suppose I want to create the next best of beam. What is it? It is a beam that at the center has a dark region like this. So how do you create it? Well, there's no choice. If you use this method, you have to add a second phase plate. That's called a vortex plate. You add a vortex, you add this phase here, and you can have the, any, in principle, any high order Bessel beam, as long as you use the right, uh, the right end here. So what we did in this paper here is on the same phase function, we, we designed two, two sort of structures. In, in the first one, we just created a zero order Bessel beam to do better what these uh, guys do here. The next one is to design a metasurface with a, you see this is an angular phase five that gives you a vortex. And so you can sometimes people call this, I don't like the terminology, bottle beams. And so does it work? Yes, it works pretty nicely. This is a meta axicon designed for the blue, high numerical aperture. Uh, the, this one creates a, the first uh, Bessel beam. You see here it's uh, diffraction limited. And over this distance with a natural camera, you see there is no divergence, okay? Now, if we add that phase on the same uh, uh, surface, you can see now that we have a dark region here. And in fact, if you go with a natural camera, you don't see light here. And uh, so I'm going to tell you, so this is to some extent a personal vision, but I believe a, a lot in it. Uh, we know planar technology is central to IC technology. It's a technology platform. It's a standardized process. Our goal is, to essentially make CMOS compatible flat optics platform based, for example, on this material. There might be other for high volume markets. This is a high quality material. It's already a platform. For the near AI, you can do this. And so the vision is that the foundries in the future, and we are talking already to foundries as we speak, will be able to combine the same type of technology to make planar or flat metal lenses and uh, the actual chip for the sensor. And of course, if you have everything planar, it's simpler because also the, uh, the optical uh, alignment is easier. Now, you know, in a camera module or cell phone, there are about six or seven lenses. The question, how many do we need with metal lenses? We don't know the answer, but we think you, you can go down to actually uh, two or three. You can play games also to combine refractive optics with this metal lens optics. So there's a lot of exciting stuff that can be done there are a lot of applications. I listed some of these here. Some of these are OEM markets. We are not interested in OEM markets. You have Tor Labs that you know, can wipe you out because they can make high volume optical components just about anything. The key point that metasurface give you ab arbitrary control of the phase, amplitude, and polarization of light. And the multifunctionality is something we have just started to explore. And I invite you to go to the next two talks uh, that I mentioned because I'm sure they're going to have some interesting thing. And of course, we had to start our company. We call it Metalens. We have finished the seed round. The good, this is my student who created the atomic layer deposition process of titanium dioxide. This is our CEO, very experienced. We have raised some significant capital from investor and some real major industry backing. So we are really excited about this. And of course, none of this work would not have been possible without a great number of collaborators. I want to mention, of course, my colleague, uh, Professor David Clark, for the uh, work uh, collaboration on the tunable lenses. Reza just uh, left us to join a major startup, that's Magic Leap, which I think you have, and that maybe tells you something. Okay, these are some of the current postdoc students. I uh, uh, was blessed to have a fantastic uh, visiting uh, young scientist from uh, uh, the Ecole Normale uh, Supérieure, and uh, these are other former student, present students. So with this I end, and I thank you for your attention. Well, thanks for a great talk. Now, uh, questions? Oh. How will be the transmission loss? Course. The absorption loss is basically negligible here in the actual titanium oxide, right? But there is, of course, diffractive losses, right? You are discretizing an actual phase, so, e so inevitably there is some see-through. The actual backscattering is actually small because the equivalent uh, index of this is actually a glassy substrate, right? 
So there are several tricks. We can, uh, as I say, we can play on the actual coupling, uh, couple uh, the, and we are working on it. And then we can, uh, uh, we can also do effective impedance matching inside uh, two groups, the group of, uh, in Michigan, uh, working with Vlad uh, uh, Shalev, sorry, I forget the name of his Michigan colleague, made the, uh, years ago the first uh, uh, um, um, impedance match uh, gradient metasurfaces. So with these tricks, I think we will be able to future, you see, if we, want to, if we really want to lose this lens in a cell phone and we have to have six, there's no choice. We have to have an efficiency probably higher than 90%. But with improvements that we'll do probably over the years and having less lenses, I think uh, these difficulties are not unsurmountable. How about scattering loss? Well, you know, scatter, it's all diffraction, okay? So uh, that's what I called. I called this scattering is diffraction. There is no, there is no what I call uh, scattering in a sense of random due to disorder because it's controllable. In fact, you can make controllable disorder in this structure if you want. You know, you can implement all kinds of interesting sequences and we are working on it, which is intermediate between disorder and order, like uh, Rudin Shapiro, Fibonacci, whatever, you know, right? Yeah, go ahead. Very nice talk. Thank you, Federico. I had a sort of naive question. Uh, from my knowledge of uh, lens design, you usually make lots of surfaces and you need to have true time delay be between them to allow for free space propagation. How can I collapse everything yeah. onto one surface? Well, Could you comment? Well, can I focus on one question about, uh, for example, making a, a broadband lens, a really broadband lens, okay? Because then you have propagation paths that are very long. And how are you going to work on the actual phases, okay? so. One thing is we use this element of the actual design, which is uh, to having multiple of, uh, of two pies per element. And we are literally engineering the, uh, the actual dispersion. So while I can't say more, but I can say, I can say some, I, I can quote three results. All are unpublished. One is by the Nanfan group at uh, Columbia, my former student, where Cleo announced a broadband lens in the near IR, really broadband. Then there is a group I talked to, to Professor Deep, Deep Insai and, and uh, in a, a group in Nanjing. They have done similar but with a different design. Lately, using yet another design, we have been able to make an achromatic lens that focuses the whole visible from the blue to the, gray, to the red with the same focal distance. This is, I think, uh, nice. We don't have yet the efficiency really needed the numerical aperture is 0.2, but I think uh, these uh, problems of uh, essentially converting, one can convert this question about that our propagation phase typically of, of diffractive optics into a certain phase design. Moreover, we are exploring right now to uh, combine for certain application refractive optics with uh, diffractive. Why not? Meta lenses, it all depends on your application. We shouldn't be limited by any bias. So hopefully this, uh, Shaya, I know you always ask good questions, but at least gives you some hint. <laughs> well, I'll stay tuned. Well, okay, let's send the speakers for all these uh, great uh, talks and thanks.